We have a special guest here today. One of my, actually not one of my, my former co-host. We're going to talk about the K versus Jalen Green matchup a few nights ago that we all just witnessed. We'll also talk about Sadiq Bain, some of his recent struggles, and also was what we saw from Killian Hayes featured in the offense uh, last game, something where just that game because of his hand wrap, or is it something that's going to become a new trend moving forward now that Kay Cunningham is becoming more featured as a ball handler in the offense? All in today's episode of the Lockdown Pistons podcast. <laughs> Are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. This episode is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends over at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Per usual, I'm your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter, at Kuka Hill. You can find the podcast over on YouTube. Now, we are been over there for about a month now, I believe. Go hit the subscribe button over there if you haven't already. Even if you don't like watching it on YouTube, just simply go support the podcast. Go over there, hit the subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. And we're also on every podcast platform. Thank you for making Lockdown Fitness your first listen every single day. Again, we are free and available on all your podcast platforms. So, today... Today's episode, like I said, we're going to be talking about the K Cunningham versus Jalen Green. Uh, not Jalen Green. Why do, I've called him Jalen Green twice now. you got to keep it going with the Clarence Green joke. More and more people are starting to get it. You guys were commenting on my last video asking, who the hell is Clarence Green? Why do you keep calling him that? Uh, a lot of you guys started to explain all of them. It's starting to catch up more and more. I'm telling you, I'm start, starting to see all kinds of fans call him it. Uh, but let me introduce you guys to our guest today. He was my former co-host over at Hashtag Pistons. A lot of you guys who suggested me for this podcast when the opportunity arose, said that, you know, I liked listening to Koo over there at Hashtag Pistons. So you guys will probably know who it is if you were previously listening to me. This is my friend, Joe Truck. Joe, how you doing, man? First time on the podcast. I know you've been wanting to get on for a minute. How you feeling, man? I'm feeling great. Happy to be here. I'm real excited to be recording with you. It's been a while. Uh, so, yeah, I'm ready to, I'm ready to dive right into it. <laughs> and that we're gonna do that we're gonna dive right into it so the Pistons like I said just talk or not just talk but just played the Houston Rockets a few days ago when obviously against Clarence Green the number two overall pick number one and number two overall pick for the first time this season over on a national televised game where the Pistons had only won one game I believe in the last four or five years uh Joe just what were your immediate takeaways from from the game did you have fun in, watching the game uh, I know there was a little bit back and forth between Jalen Gr- or Clarence Green. My bad. I got to keep it going. Clarence Green and Kay Cunningham. Uh, I, I don't know if I would call it necessarily going back and forth, but more so him going at Cade. Kay kind of going back at him after the game with some Instagram posts and, and a quote talking about, you know, he thought it was all for cameras. Just what were your immediate takeaways from that game? Um, I mean, it's, it is kind of interesting that there, there is, I think there is a genuine Thing between those two guys uh really there's probably more of a thing with Clarence than there is with uh with Cade like I'm not sure that Cade cares that much about it but he definitely did you know take a t- couple subtle shots about it yeah. after the game in the post game saying it was all for the cameras and then his Instagram post and stuff so uh it is just kind of interesting because you know you don't see a lot of that in today's NBA I mean it's a thing that especially old heads complain about all the time how all the players today are all buddy buddy and they all are good friends but there really is a thing with these two guys I think there's no way around it and uh yeah I think for the for the actual game I mean first off it was really nice to win um you know I mean the Pistons have two wins they're over the Magic and the Rockets so two other really <laughs> terrible teams but at the very least it's nice that like you know, against other teams that are also, you know, similarly as young as the Pistons are and sort of in that same trajectory that they've beaten them both in in both games. They looked pretty good. The one thing that was nice about this one is the young guys played more because against the Magic, a lot of the vets played pretty long stretches, which was, you know, that's not that that's not as much fun. Uh, But yeah, I mean, you know, the real thing with Clarence is like, I don't trust any hoopers that care way too much about their hair. Like dudes that care. <laughs> what what great NBA players clearly care too much about their hair. And I'm not talking like, you know, Allen Iverson had cornrows, but that was just his thing. He wore those all the time, right? Like that's not cares too much about his hair. It's just like that's just how he does his hair. Or like Ben would have the fro, but then he'd also do cornrows. That's just that's just how he did his hair. But like Michael Jordan, 
Dude just went bald eventually. Kobe <laughs> just went straight bald. LeBron fought the balding for a little bit, but eventually he just gave up. Dwayne Wade, he just went bald. Like Tim Duncan, he never did anything with his hair till he retired. All of the greats don't care about their hair. That man cares too much about his hair, and I just I can't get behind any any hoopers that care too much about their hair. Like really clearly, like he he must have like four or five different conditioners because it just it's got <laughs> volume, you know. Like I just I can't trust that. If you're out on the court worrying about how your hair looks and making sure it's got the right voluptuousness, <laughs> can't be behind that dude. And that's the real takeaway for me is that Cade, you know, he's got a little bit, he's got a little something going on, but he's not, he clearly isn't too worried about it. He's just like, this is my hair, uh, but I'm here to play basketball, not to model for a fashion shoot here. You know? Fair enough. Fair enough. I did make some subtle jokes at, at Clarence as well last on the last podcast talking about how he looks like he'd be acting like my fiance in the mirror taking taking selfies nonstop uh, with what he'd be doing. Uh, but yeah, I think it was obviously fun to get a win versus the, the versus the Rockets, like you said, another bad team. Uh, but the Pistons, you know, they they haven't necessarily had an, an easy schedule at all so far. They've played multiple contenders twice, uh, Milwaukee once. Like it's been it's been a really tough schedule for the Pistons. So you know, the fact that they were able to take care of business and the two times that they actually did go against someone who. I mean, I guess you would call a winnable game. Um, it, it, it's good to see. Um, from from the matchup between Cade and Clarence, um, I I thought Cade played really well. Um, he was he played efficient. This is probably his most not probably his it was his most efficient game of the season. Uh, and, and I didn't really see anything different from him. I saw him creating the same type of looks for himself, still getting the same type of space he he was getting the first however many games he played. I believe it was three, three, four games. Uh, but this game, he just seemed like he knocked more rust off. He was hitting more outside shots, obviously. Uh, he hit that one shot late with a minute and a half left to give the Pistons the three-point lead, uh, which was big for them at that point in time. Uh, and, yeah, and after Clarence got that dunk in, against a high school press, I don't, he didn't score again uh, after that. So, you know, all that screaming was for nothing. But, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a fun matchup, obviously. Like you said, old heads have been asking for I think a lot of us around my age, our age, you know, I think we would like to see some more of that too. Not, you know, not so much like complaining about nonstop, I guess, as old heads do. But I mean, it's fun when you have rivalries like that. It's fun to watch that happen. Uh, so if this ends up being a rivalry like that, which it seems like it's going to be because the Houston Rockets guard seems to really, I mean, it's like the first month and a half after he was drafted, he talked nonstop about Detroit more than he did Houston. So it seems like he really does have an issue. Uh, and it looks like it will be a rivalry as it keeps going. Uh, throughout their career, so it, it'll be fun. Hopefully, our guy wins a lot more than he loses this matchup. You got you got any other things you want to point out real quick before we move yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, just jokes aside, it's also fun because they both really do look like they're going to be. I mean, Cade, I really am. Uh, I'm all the way in on him. I think he looks great. It was really nice to see him get some three point shots to fall because <laughs> obviously we know that being a good shooter is going to be an important part of his game because. Uh, I think some a lot of people, I you know, you could even say me, are maybe a little over concerned about the fact that he's not a super explosive athlete, but clearly he's not going to dominate games with his athleticism. So finding his shot is going to be an important part of him becoming effective. And the other thing to remember is that he was not that good of a shooter going into college. In fact, a lot of scouts listed it as a as a concern with him when he shot great last year in college. So to see him get some shots to fall from from uh, from deep, he went four of eight from three. I think was really great, but uh, in you know Clarence, <laughs> he uh, <laughs> I'm I'm a little less sure about him just because he's he seems to sort of fit a little bit into the classic like he he'll score a lot, do some cool stuff, but what does he do to help you win type of a deal? But he clearly has all the tools. And the other thing is from his time in the G League last year, you heard really great things about his work ethic, uh, as much as you know jokes about his hair aside and stuff like that, like supposedly he works like an absolute maniac. So I think there's a really good chance that they're both going to end up being really, really great players. And that's really what makes a rivalry fun. Rivalries aren't that much fun outside of like, like in college football, everyone's passionate enough that the two teams can be bad. But like outside of that type of a thing for a real rivalry to be born, both teams have to be good. Or in this case, both players have to be good. And I think that both players have a real chance to be, uh, really excellent. And it was fun to watch last night. Um, and obviously it was particularly fun because uh, we won. <laughs> yeah, obviously. So, you know, I, I agree with everything you said there. Hopefully, I mean, I, I crack a lot of jokes about Clarence Green, but I, he, he obviously has a lot of tools, like you said, to be a really good player. Um, I, I've voiced my concerns before 
the draft that maybe he would be just like a J.R. Smith type of player, and that's why my, some of my concerns. But, you know, he also has a real good chance of being a really great player as well with how, how athletic he is, how um, his offensive – sometimes he can just explode from deep as well. So it's he, he has some tools. Hopefully they both become players and, and Cade just becomes a way better player for the Pistons. But yeah. when we come back from after this break, we're going to talk a little bit about Sadiq Bey, who has struggled a little bit over the last six games. Is this something to be worried about? Uh, is this just a little slump? We'll talk about that in the upcoming segment. But first, let me tell you about some of our sponsors. First up, let me tell you about you guys' favorite fast food restaurant, McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family can come to reconnect, a place where classmates can come meet for a study group, knowing they'll have dependable Wi-Fi and endless supplies of French fries and McFlurries. Win or lose is a place where teammates, competitors, the home team, or the away team can come to recharge. It's the place you always look forward to stopping at on a long road trip to rest your legs and refuel. I tell you guys this almost every episode now. A few weeks ago, when me and my fiance went on a trip to Chicago, the first thing we did before we got on the highway, we went and got McDonald's, had their, some of their breakfast. So I'm telling you guys right now, wake up early, go get some breakfast. I'm telling you that sausage, egg, and cheese with muffin is totally worth it. So make sure you guys go ahead to your local McDonald's to refuel and reconnect. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba, I'm loving it. Then let me tell you guys, I know you guys love that jingle, by the way, uh, but let me tell you about another one of our sponsors, BetOnline AG. We're back and better than ever. A new web interface for the start of the basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code locked on to receive your bonus. Yes, that's promo code locked on from basketball, football, any trail, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all their amazing offers available for the 2021 season. BetOnline is also the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. BetOnline, where the game starts. So, Joe, I know, I know when you know we we did a podcast together back then. We didn't do we didn't do stuff like that. How how do you think my ad reads are, man? Uh, they're impeccable. Every time I'm at work and I hear you advertise for McDonald's, every time I think, man, I wish I didn't start work at four in the morning because I really wish I could have gotten some McDonald's on my way here, but you know, work shortages and stuff, the McDonald's on my way to work, they're never open. There's like been one time that they were, and I admit, went in there, got myself a McMuffin, hash brown, can't, can't top it for breakfast. There you go. There you go. Joe knows. But uh, before we get into the segment, let me tell you guys again, thank you for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. And make sure you guys go to YouTube, subscribe to the channel. Even if you guys don't like watching it on YouTube, again, we are trying to get to a thousand subscribers. We're trying to upgrade the podcast. So if you just love the podcast, you want to support us, an easy way by doing that is to simply go to our YouTube, Lockdown Pistons, and hit the subscribe button. We'd really appreciate it. We're trying to hit that 1K by the end of the year. Uh, we're sitting around, I think right now, we just crossed over 450 subscribers. So we're doing a pretty good job. Let's keep it going. Go hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. But, Joe, let's talk about Sadiq Bey a little bit. So all my listeners know that throughout the offseason, I talked. I, I was very critical of Sadiq Bey. I thought he was working on the wrong things. Uh, I didn't really like him working on outside things. I, I wanted him to just, you know, try to develop his 3 and D game and, and, and try to, you know, maximize that. Obviously, they, they wanted him to try – spread out his game a little bit. I was very concerned about that. But through the first four games of the season, it looked like that it was a legit improvement and something he actually got a lot better at. Um, then after that, the last six games, it's been really tough for Sadiq, though. Really tough for him. He's shooting right now uh, on, on over the last six games. He's shooting 31% from the field, 25% from deep. He's having 10 points a game, five rebounds, three assists. So – my question to you right now, Joe, is, is this something that you think that Sadiq Bey, do you think he's just in the middle of a slump right now? I've said before, you know, I'm not saying he needs to stop working on other things. It's going to be a long year. It's only 10 games. He's going to go through some ups and some lows. If he wants to, he, you want to see him fight through this low that he's going through right now. So I have a problem with him still working on those things and trying to bring those things to the table. Um, but are you concerned at all? More so, I think with his outside shooting, something that was supposed to be his bread and butter, what he's supposed to be a lead at, what the Pistons desperately need out of him. It's been 10 games now, and he hasn't really shot very well from deep at all, uh, all 10 games. So are you worried at all about him, or do you think it's just, you know, 
it's a low point. It's a long season. He's he's a great shooter naturally. He'll get through this, and it's not that big of a deal. Uh, I mean, it depends a little bit on what your definition of you know being concerned is. Uh, so I actually didn't have him pegged all the way as like a super top tier um, three point shooter after last season because he shot what thirty eight percent on really high volume, which is really good. But you need to remember last season the league average was almost thirty seven percent. And there's different theories for why it was so high, largely just linked to that because of COVID and everything else. There wasn't a lot of practicing. Uh, Teams just weren't as ready every day, so it was a little bit harder. And then also remember, as a rookie and playing on a team that no one really took seriously most of the season, uh, that also makes it easier. And now people know that he's a dude who can shoot. They know he's a dude that they want to cover. Um, And then also league average shooting is way down this season so far, at least early. In fact, that's been one of the bigger stories league-wide so far is that offenses are less potent, and in particular, three-point shooting is down. So, I mean, I didn't have him – I I didn't have him pegged automatically as, like, one of those absolute top-tier shooters, you know, a guy – you know, guys like, you know, classic would be like J.J. Redick, Kyle Korver types, that they're just – they're a real problem. They're not just 3 and D guys. Like, they're so good as shooters that they can be genuine offensive weapons. Um, I thought he could be that, but I, I didn't have him pegged there yet. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm not that concerned, but that's because I didn't necessarily think he was automatically going to be an absolute tippy top level shooter. Obviously he's going to shoot better than he's shooting right now, but there's a pretty big difference. Even if in the percentage points, it's not that much to be like between say 37% versus 40%. It doesn't seem like that big of a difference when you just look at the stat sheet. But on the volume of shots that he takes from deep or we want him to take from deep and the sort of, you know, just he's got such a quick trigger, or at least when he's on his game, he is, he has a quick trigger. Um, That makes a big difference in terms of how defenses approach you. And obviously when you're a shooter, a lot of your value comes from not just the shot you hit, but the fact that defenses have to really account for you in the space and you provide. And so there, it'll. I'm interested to see where he ends up. If he ends up being just a good shooter, so that he's a guy that defenses obviously have to guard, or if he can reach that level of being like a really elite shooter that isn't just a guy you can't leave alone, but like as a guy you have to game plan around because of his ability to shoot. And I'm still optimistic he can get there, but um, it's definitely not a great sign the degree to which he has struggled so far. And I think it's probably bad enough that it's it's hard to explain it away with just saying that it oh he's just in a slump because I'm he's at what he's at like twenty seven percent on the season I think right yeah mm-hmm. like he's at twenty eight percent on the season that's not just bad that's real bad and so I think that there's a chance that there is actually something going on especially because of the fact that. Um, and something that we never saw at all last season. He's looked hesitant at times. There's no other way to put it. Yeah. Uh, there's been a couple of times. I know you've talked about it on the pod, so we don't need to rehash it all. Like you've talked about the specific plays. So uh, there's definitely been times where he's looked hesitant. He's passed up threes. And, you know, I'm not sure if that's just as simple as um, he just misread the play. Like maybe he got the ball and he was just too eager to pass it on. Uh, you know, especially with Killian and Kate on the floor, you know, that kind of passing becomes infectious. So maybe he just, got hit by that and it doesn't actually mean anything, but it's happened enough for a guy who didn't have any hesitation at all from last season. And that lack of hesitation really makes a big difference for a shooter. So yeah, it's not like a huge concern. I would say it's probably most accurate to say that I wouldn't be too worried about it yet, but definitely at this point, something that's worth monitoring because it's like, it's not bad enough that you should be bailing on Sadiq Bay, but it's, it's now enough of a sample size and not just sample size, but there's enough stuff on film that suggests something might actually be going on here that you definitely want to monitor it. And if it goes on for like, let's say, so we're if if we're 20 games in, so for like another what three weeks from now or a month from now, and it's still in this range, then you might start to be like, there might actually be something wrong with Sadiq Bay. That said, I think he'll probably he'll even out to a point. It'll just be a matter of if he evens out to a point where he's shooting, you know, a little above league average from three on high volume, say he's a good shooter, or if he can find that form and make a step and become like an elite, elite shooter. So that's really the question for me. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you with, I think it's something to monitor. 
Um, again, it's a long season, 82 games. Obviously, we're only 10 games in. Uh, but like I said on the last few podcasts, 10 straight games for a shooter of Sadiq Bay's caliber to be shooting this poorly, I think is – like you said, something to keep monitoring of, and it's not just it's 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 not just the fact that he's not hitting shots right now. And like you said, I've talked about it a lot in the podcast. It's the fact that he's running away from open threes, he's been passing up open threes, he's been passing up open threes to take harder threes. Uh, it's it's just a lot of it's it's been a really tough past six games for him. Uh, he looked a little bit better in the fourth quarter of this past game, like we've talked about. Uh, he's he he got a little bit more aggressive, and was one of the main reasons I thought his little spark. That was one of the reasons why the Pistons were able to pull away, obviously. But outside of that, he's it's definitely something to keep monitoring, something to keep an eye on, uh, because it's it's you don't expect him to struggle this much this long. Uh, but like you said, it definitely is a good point to bring up the fact that you know offense across the league is struggling, outside shooting is struggling across the league, uh, outside of everyone. I mean, KD is the only one who seems to not care about the new ball, but apparently a lot of players are complaining about the new ball. Um, in my experience. You know, I'm I'm not an NBA player, but I played basketball my whole life. Changing the balls do like I guess change things, but like not to this degree. I feel like it shouldn't like I don't feel like that it should be this damn big of a deal for people, especially professionals. But I guess maybe it is. Uh, and then also this year, fans are back. I don't know if that will have a big uh, uh, some kind of impact versus last year. Uh, last year, guys were just shooting in empty gyms, uh, which kind of I feel like kind of makes it easier. But yeah, we'll keep monitoring what happens to Sadiq, Sadiq Bay moving forward. Hopefully he snaps out of it. Uh, but definitely I feel like it's something that you guys need to be watching for because, like I said, 10 games I think is a decent enough sample size of consistently struggling to hit outside shots. And and like Joe said, not just the stats, but watching film of him running away from open threes, passing up open threes, being hesitant to take open threes, taking tough tougher threes when he had an open three, like all those things combined. I think I think it's time you, you should start monitoring it and keeping an eye out for it. But when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about Killian Hayes now. Uh, this past game, he wasn't featured that much in the offense. I've said that I think it may be because of his hand wrap, the thumb injury he had because beforehand, I thought they were actually doing a pretty good job the previous few games of balancing Killian on ball and off ball. We'll talk about Killian and his season thus far and moving forward now with Kay Cunningham seemingly back fully healthy. But before we do all that, let me tell you about another one of our sponsors, your guys' favorite sponsor, Built Bar. I love Thanksgiving. All the good food and treats, and plenty of them, trust me. But maybe you want a yummy dessert, but isn't so full of calories and sugar. It's the perfect time for Built Bars. Built Bar is the new holiday dessert that you guys will all love. Feast on something delicious and feel good about it. One slice of pie has upwards of 300 calories, and that's on the low end. Most Built Bars are only 130 calories and only 4 grams of sugar with plenty of protein. We place the coconut cream pie with coconut Built Bar. Or go for a raspberry built bar instead of that raspberry pie. Lots of good flavors to replace any pie possible. Low calories, low carbs, low fat, and high protein. And it's also covered in 100% real chocolate that's soft and easy on the teeth to chew. Built is a great option for when you're hungry. If Thanksgiving isn't coming soon enough, go for a built bar or two right now. Go serve some at your family gatherings. It'll make things less awkward, I promise. Maybe ben, maybe Aunt Betty hasn't tried a built bar yet, and it'll make her in a better mood so you don't have to sit there all awkward all the time. No surprises, new surprises all month. Limited time flavors arriving at Built.com regularly. So go check the site often. And there's also nothing like a Built Built Bar Black Friday. Mark your calendars. Black Friday will be a huge event with all sorts of surprises. So go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15, and you'll get 15% off your order. That's go to Built.com and use promo code LOCK15, and you'll get 15% off your order. Built Bar, best tasting protein bar ever. So, Joe, let's talk about... Killian Hayes a little bit. Uh, I know, <coughs> excuse me, guys, I'm still dealing with that sickness. Uh, but also, actually, before we dive into anything, let me thank you guys again for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. Uh, and also, make sure you go check out check us out over on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Really appreciate the support. Uh, but, yeah, Joe, I know last year you, you've you had your concerns about Killian Hayes. Um, Killian Hayes is now 35 games into his NBA career. Still not even halfway through a singular season. Um, I've talked about it a lot in the podcast. That I feel like that he's gotten better and better as the season's gone on. His first two games, the next two games were better than his first two games. And then following two games were better than the next two games. I feel like he's gotten better and has shown more each game that he's played. Um, specifically, I thought they were doing a really good job of balancing him and Kay Cunningham as both on-ball and off-ball threats against the Milwaukee Bucks and against the Philadelphia 76ers the last uh, 
the two games before he had that thumb injury that made him sit against Brooklyn. Uh, I thought they did a great job of that. Uh, the offense was looking really good, I thought. Uh, Killian, I thought, was having some of his best games. He was playing really well, I thought. Um, right now, he's shooting 37% from deep. Uh, it's not on some crazy volume, but it's on relatively the same volume as last year, and he was 27% shooter last year. So that's a market – market. <clears throat> my God. That's a pretty good improvement uh, to be having so far. But in this last game against the Houston Rockets, he was almost completely taken out of the offense. I don't think he ran a single pick and roll. I don't think he initiated – the offense even once I, I I mean I don't remember it uh, and I watch Killian closely you guys know I, I'm I'm someone who watches him very closely and tries to analyze everything with him I don't think he ran anything once um, obviously he's dealing with the sprain thumb he still has that wrap on his main hand his left hand um, Joe do you think that that was more so because of his injury obviously to his dominant hand uh, I, uh, or so they're trying to like you know play him off ball not ask him to do too much with that because uh, obviously he wanted to play, and he was playing pretty damn good defense as well, frustrating the hell out of Kevin Porter Jr. Uh, throughout the entire game. Or do you think that's a trend that's going to continue to happen now that Kay Cunningham seems to be more healthy, and it's going to be more so just you know Cade running the show the whole time, and Cade or and Killian just playing off ball? Uh, it's pretty hard to say. Um, you know the 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 thumb injury is a real easy explanation for it. it it's the most sensible one. Um, but on the other hand, it's not like Killian just kind of looking invisible on the offensive end of the court is something that hasn't been pretty common for him in his young career. Uh, it He seemed to have kind of snapped out of that in the previous few games, like you mentioned. Uh, he was getting more involved. He was running some actions with ball screens for himself. Uh, he was being really aggressive, which was really nice. But it, it's hard to say. Uh, the biggest concern there to me is that the offense is not really structured enough um, to make sure to sort of force him into the game. And we don't need to go too deep in that for your sake. Uh, we don't want to get anyone in trouble here. But, uh, <laughs> you know, just at a basic level, um, you know, when you got so many young guys on the team and Killian, I think very clearly Killian is or has gone through some sort of issues with um, confidence in himself at the NBA level. I think there's no doubt about that. You watch his game. Like when you watch the way he played um, in Europe, in Germany, before he arrived in the NBA, it looks like a very different guy a lot of the time when he's been in the NBA. Just clearly he's not as confident in himself. And it, But it did seem like he was really regaining that, um, that sort of confidence recently. Uh, and that was a bit, is a big part of the reason why, you know, anybody who's, you know, read me, followed me on Twitter or whatever, knows that I was not a big fan of Killian Hayes leading up to the draft, was not super thrilled that they drafted him, uh, just because I basically doubted that he's a good enough athlete to get into the lane consistently, beat his own guys to the hoop, and get all the way to the cup. And I think that in the modern NBA, unless you're an elite, elite level shooter, um, it's really hard to be an effective modern day point guard without being able to get all the way to the cup with some consistency. And uh, the guy that I brought up was he kind of reminded me of Darren Hilliard a little bit where it's like if he's, you know, playing at a low enough level where the athletes are not going to be too much for him, he looks just awesome. But there's a certain brand of guys that it's like you reach a certain level where defenders are consistently able to stay in front of you and it kind of saps a lot out of their game. Um, but once again, I so far this season, Killian has – uh, my, my in my in my game recaps, I now call it the Killing Hayes Beliefometer, and um, it has ticked up a little bit. In particular, there's been quite a few plays where even without a ball screen, he's just clearly got it decided. I'm gonna get to the hoop. I'm gonna die trying. And a few times he succeeded. A few times he has died trying. But at the very least, I love the fact that he's kind of getting the mindset of, you know, it. I may fail, but nothing good is going to come from me just faffing about and not being involved in the offense. You know, nothing's going to happen unless I try to force this issue. And I'm really glad that he has done some of that. So I would lean towards with this Houston game that it's just the thumb uh, just because he really had been showing that um, he, he really seemed like he had been breaking out of that. And then obviously he didn't play in, in the previous game against Brooklyn. Um, and also, like you said, he really played great defense. So it's not like he was it, – it didn't seem like he was totally out of the game or like his head wasn't in the game or 
he wasn't playing hard or anything like that. And there have been a couple of times I felt like um, he's almost gotten lost on defense because he's been so uninvolved in the offense. There have been times where that has seemed to be the case, though, with young point guards. It's hard to know if that's just that they are not feeling involved or if it's just that they're confused about what's happening on defense, obviously. But I felt like he seemed really engaged on the defensive end. And so I wouldn't be shocked if it was just like, yeah, because of his thumb, he maybe can't really shoot or dribble comfortably. But obviously, you know, you don't necessarily need to be able to use your thumb to play really good defense. You know, you just you move your feet and stuff. And he's obviously long. Uh, so I wouldn't be shocked if that's what it is. And that would be my guess. But when you've got off to the start to your career that Killian Hayes has, there's no way that every single time that one of these games happens, even if there is an easy explanation, it'll still be a little bit uncomfortable just because, you know, <laughs> he definitely has shown that it's a bugaboo for him. So I'm really rooting for him hard, though, because he just – I love the fit of him and Cade. I think people that are concerned about the fit with those two, um, I actually – that's now one of my things, that if you think Killian and Cade are a bad fit together, that's a sign that you're not a serious person, quite <laughs> frankly. Like, well, okay, so here's the thing, right? The main thing people say is, well, Killing is not a good shooter. And now, first off, worth mentioning, he shot okay this year, like you mentioned. But the thing is, if Killing can't shoot, he won't fit with Cade, not because he can't fit with Cade. He won't fit with Cade because he's going to be a crappy NBA player. Like, let's just be realistic about that. If Killing can't shoot, at, be at least like a league average shooter, he's not an NBA starter. He's not athletic enough to be a guy who just dominates in the paint um so if he's not at least a league average shooter he's not an nba starter so then you don't worry about it but if he can be a decent shooter they're going to be a great fit they're versatile defensively uh which we've already seen that and this is something you talked about in, the, in fact i think actually you brought up my tweet on the pot a few days ago talking about that you know having two guys on the floor as big as they are with the vision that they have and the ball handling that they have it's just powerful there's no other way to put it um, I'm like, you th I think almost back to the, I, they're not this good, obviously, but you think back to like the Heatles and it's like before Dwayne Wade's knees started to really go out on him, I just having LeBron and Dwayne Wade, two guys that also ostensibly did not necessarily fit that well because Dwayne Wade is a non-shooter. LeBron's not a great shooter, which is like just having two awesome playmakers who are both big for their positions see the whole floor and are just really high basketball IQ guys. It's just a really, really powerful thing to have. And, um, you know, we'll see if I'm, I'm confident Cade's going to come close to his upside. I have no idea if Killian's going to hit his upside or if he's going to end up just being, uh, he's a good enough defender that he's pretty much cemented. He'll be at least a decent backup for a long time because at the very least he can defend and guards, you know, multi-positional defenders, they stay in the league. Simply put, I mean, David Nwaba's, on team every single summer. So, <laughs> you know, if he can stick around, Killing can stick around. But so I have no idea if he'll reach that peak, but it's like a good version of Killian Hayes is an excellent fit with Cade, in particular because the main concern with Killian is like, can he be that real fulcrum of the offense without being a consistent penetrator into the defense? And it's like, you've got Cade Cunningham on your team, then you don't need to be the consistent penetrator of the defense. You don't need to line up and run a thousand pick and rolls and take guys off the dribble all the time. You can do a lot of your act, your work off of reacting defenses, defenses that are reacting to stuff that Cade can do. And we've already seen that Cade is fully capable of um, penetrating opposing defenses. And you know the other thing that I've really liked about Killian, and I know that we're I, we, we're, we're up against it a little bit time wise, so this will be my last thought on it. Is when he first came into the league, I thought he was um, there's a term that some people use a tuxedo score where they kind of don't want to do the dirty work. They don't want to get too physical. They kind of want to just like the most classic tuxedo score in the league right now is D'Angelo Russell, unquestionably, right? He's very, it's very aesthetically pleasing to watch, but just totally non-physical doesn't really want to do a lot of the dirty work. And I feel like this season in particular, when I talk about where he's just like, I'm going to get ahead of steam. I'm going to throw myself at the hoop and it might work and it might not, but I'm going to do it. That sort of thing that shows not just like a different, you know, an improvement in skill or anything that shows a change in mentality for him. And that's the thing that's got me somewhat hopeful and excited about where he can go, because if he can have that kind of a mentality about him and continue to shoot at, you know, a decent level, uh, that's going to be a really good thing for him. So, yeah, that, that'll be my last thought on that, because I know we're running up against the time.
that's fine. That's fine. If you listen to the hashtag Piston Podcast when we co-hosted, you know that Joe goes on his long soliloquies and has to get all his points out. Uh, but he, the points he brings up are very accurate. Like he said, we are up against the time, so I'm not going to give much of a response to that. But I will ask Joe one last question. Just quick answer, Joe. Killian is shooting 37% from deep right now. His jump shot, he looks like he's much more confident in that jump shot, especially off catch and shooting. His form looks like it's a little bit more tightened up. Are you through 10 games? Just give me a quick answer. Are you confident in this being a, a, a sign for the future, or is it small sample size that we regress back to the mean? Um, I would lean towards this is really what he is as a shooter. He was a good shooter before he arrived in the NBA. Uh, his form is a little wonky, but it's certainly it's not one of these dudes that shows up with a broken form or anything. Uh, and even last season, as some Killian stands have brought up, he shot pretty decently on spot-up looks. He hasn't taken as many of the really goofy, quite frankly, stupid step back looks that he doesn't hit very often. So I'm not going to say that, oh, he's arrived and he's a good shooter now, but I would lean towards he's going to be a plus shooter because that's what he was billed as, as a in his profile and his form looks okay. And he actually shot decently as a spot up guy last season. So yeah, I would lean towards he's going to be a decent shooter for sure. All right. Fair enough. You guys know that I like Killian Hayes a lot. I hope he continues to improve and continues to be part of the offense. Uh, I'm sure moving forward, we'll talk a lot more again about me wanting to see him rim more pick and rolls, but <sighs> doubt. I don't know if that's going to end up ever happening, but this would, for reasons out of my control and things I can't, I can't It'll really happen control. eventually. We just need to, <laughs> you know, a few dominoes we need to start falling. <laughs> I'm yeah, sure. I think we're well. about. Probably, probably about three years away, I think. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Try three months, bro. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you guys for listening to this podcast, man. I really appreciate it. Make sure you goes, guys go down below. Give me a five-star review. I'd really appreciate it. And also, make sure you go to YouTube again and subscribe to the Lockdown Pistons YouTube channel. Also, make sure you guys go check out Lockdown Fantasy Basketball. If you guys are interested in fantasy basketball, host Josh Lloyd does a great job of giving you all the tidbits insight who to start who to bench who to pick up all those kind of things so make sure you guys go check out that podcast and also make sure you go follow joe at joe truck joe underscore truck on twitter and make sure you follow his podcast hashtag pistons and also follow some of his work uh all on twitter and where where is your stuff at now you have your your own website now right yep uh i do still occasionally write at piston powered and i've got a sub stack it's just joe truck sub stack it's on my twitter all right make sure you guys make sure yep there you go go check out his twitter will be on there so make sure you guys go check all that out I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Until the next one, uh, actually, the Pistons play the Cleveland Cavaliers tonight. Hopefully, it's a excuse me a fun game, and the Pistons maybe get another win tonight. But until Monday, we'll review what happened over the weekend and in tonight's game. But until then, I'll see you guys later. Thank you, Joe, for coming on. Hope you guys enjoyed, and peace out, everybody.